be the reason I live. Be my quest, my constant vision. Be the water I drink, the treasure I seek. More than gold, be a fire in my heart. My consumer.
truth and justice shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. Set 
He never stop working Even when I don't see it working Even when I don't feel it working He never stop, He never stop working He never stop, He never stop working Even when I don't see it working Even when I don't feel it working He never stop, He never stop working He never stop Never stop working, even when I don't see it working, even when I don't feel it working. You never stop, you never stop working, you never stop, you never stop working. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are. We thank you for this day. God, we thank you for who you are. Lord, especially after what we've been through, thank you that you are our light in the darkness. Thank you that that means something a little bit more to us now after going through all of this. And Lord, I ask that our hearts would be open for you to shine your light inside of us so that we can see clearly the places that you are not on the throne of our heart. Lord, help us not to to hide that from you, hide that from ourselves, but help us to deal with those places today. Have your way in us so that we can in turn be a light to this world. Um, Just have your way in this service. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And welcome to Grace Fellowship Online. It's third Sunday. You know what that means. Men's Fellowship tonight. Yay! And tonight is a Zoom meeting, so any guys that would like to join us for a Bible study in Revelation, it's a discussion. So the cool thing about it is, um, it's not just some guy talking and you listening. It's actually uh, you getting to put your input in as well. So come join us. If you don't have a link for it, see Chase, and he will get you a link. If you don't know how to get a hold of Chase, contact me. And uh, I'll get you Chase's info. Or he may have already sent me the link, so I can give you the link too. So anyway, uh, we started out with some fellowship, you know, just waiting for everybody to get on. It starts at 6. So uh, come at 6 and uh, stay for the whole discussion. Uh, We're not having any food because we don't want to just sit around and listen to each other smack. So... With that, take out your friend-to-friend card and let's pray for our friends and pray for ourselves as we open up God's Word tonight. Lord, I thank you for our friends and our family members that haven't yet come to know you. I thank you that you love them more than we do and it's your desire that they would be with you in eternity too. So Lord, I pray that you would do whatever it takes to bring them into your kingdom so that we could all spend eternity with you and together. I thank you for it, Lord, in Jesus' name. And Lord, I I thank you for your word. I ask that as we open it up, that you'd help us to open up our hearts to hear from your Holy Spirit. Speak to us. Make your word known in our hearts. My words are meaningless, but your words are life. 
<clears throat> speak that life to us tonight. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> well, open up your Bibles to 1 John chapter 2. And sorry, my dog was a little rambunctious there for a, a minute or two. Hopefully she'll settle down. She seems to be nesting in the couch. 1 John chapter 2, starting with the 18th verse. It says, Children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. By this we know that it is the last hour. They went out from among us, excuse me, they went out from us, but they did not belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. However, they went out so that it might be made clear that none of them belonged to us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and all of you know the truth. I have not written to you because you don't know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie comes from the truth. Who is the liar, if not the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This one is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. He who confesses the Son has the Father as well. What you've heard from the beginning is to remain in you. If what you have heard from the beginning remains in you, then you will remain in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he himself made to us, eternal life. I have written these things to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. As for you, the anointing you received from him remains in you, and you don't need anyone to teach you. Instead, his anointing teaches you about all things, and is true, and is not a lie. Just as it has taught you, remain in him. So now, little children, remain in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him, at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know this as well. Everyone who does what is right has been born of him. And we'll stop there. So John's talking here about the spirit of Antichrist, which is in the world. And he's saying that it's in the world when he was there. See, a lot of people use the word Antichrist and they talk about the, the Antichrist and they think that every time it's mentioned in the Bible that it's talking about this fake Jesus that Satan's going to send during the last seven years. But Paul, uh, Paul, John makes it clear that the spirit of Antichrist is in anyone who denies that Jesus is the Christ. Anyone who denies that Jesus is Lord. Anyone who denies that there is forgiveness in no other name but the name of Jesus. That person has the spirit of Antichrist. Antichrist simply means opposing Christ. So the Antichrist, with a capital A, He's going to appear in the last seven years. But there is a spirit, of, there is a anti-Jesus spirit that is on the planet laying the groundwork for this demonic person to show up. And if it was in the world when John was in the world, you can see all around us how much more it's in the world now. I mean, there are, there are forces right now. I mean, you'd have, to, you'd have to be sticking your head in the sand to not know there are forces yet, right now in the world that are laying the groundwork for the son of the devil to come and rule the world. It's already, there's nothing we can do to stop it. It's already been foretold in the book of Revelation 
and other places. So it's not our job to stop it, but we need to recognize that it's in the world. And we need to recognize who those people are. So he explains that he's warning us about people who may try to lead us astray. There are people already in this world trying to lead us astray. The false prophet, the Antichrist, who's probably already in the world, um, <coughs> they're going to try to lead even the believers away if that was possible. So we need to keep on guard. See, because many people believe that the grace of God gives us a license to sin. And people that believe that are going to be trapped in the lie of those who have the spirit of Antichrist. Those who are anti-Jesus. Those who are against Jesus. And, and what they'll do is uh, they'll promote this, you know, you can sin and ask forgiveness later. Well, the Bible doesn't say that. Grace does not give us a license to sin. It gives us a license to repent because of the kindness of God. So people who believe that grace gives us a license to sin, um, <coughs> excuse me, they cough. That's what they do. Uh, they deny the truth in Jesus Christ and they lead other people astray and into sin. This makes God quite unhappy. And it's, it's really what John's talking about here. God hates sin, not because he wants to, you know, mess up, everybody's fun. The people in the world think that Christians have no fun. They can't be more wrong. We just have clean fun. But God hates sin because it does eternal damage to a person's soul. In our day and time, as you know already, this whole thing today is kind of a review, but in our day and time, right is not popular Morality is not popular. People get upset that we try to live a moral life because they, want, they don't want to stop their own sin. <coughs> now tell me, is that the, the world we live in right now? I heard somebody say yes. <laughs> so Romans 1, verses 29 through 32, which I read every time we talk about this. <laughs> sort of describes the world that we live in right now. It says, Their lives became full of every kind of wickedness, sin, greed, hate, envy, murder, quarreling, deception, malicious behavior, and gossip. They are backstabbers, haters of God, insolent, proud, and boastful. They invent new ways of sinning, and they disobey their parents. They refuse to understand, break their promises, are heartless, and have no mercy. They know God's justice requires that those who do these things deserve to die. <coughs> Excuse me. Yet they do them anyway. Worse yet, they encourage others to do them too. Now, is that the world that we live in? I think it is. And the, the thing is, all of us have problems. And all of us mess up from time to time. But as a Christian, I need to make sure that I don't justify my problems and drag other people into sin with me. Oh, it must be okay. Don's doing it. No, I don't want to be that stumbling block to people. We've been talking about that off and on lately quite a bit. <coughs> what I need to do is admit my sin and let God deal with it. Oh, well, I won't tell God. He'll be mad at me. No, he'll forgive you. I need to make sure that I don't become a stumbling block for somebody else. Jesus talks about stumbling blocks in Matthew chapter 18, verse 6 in the New Living Translation. Um, matter of fact, most of my references, if not all of them today, 
are going to be the New Living Translation, except for the text. Matthew 18, 6 says, But if you cause one of these little ones who trusts in me to fall into sin, it would be better for you to have a large millstone tied around your neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. Well, that doesn't sound fun. Sounds like he's kind of serious about this uh, causing somebody else to sin. <coughs> now, Jesus is against suicide, but he says if you're going to run around causing other people to sin, you may as well go kill yourself. That's what he says there. That's how serious he takes it. What he would prefer is that you and I wouldn't go around causing other people to sin. We wouldn't be these people in the Romans chapter 1 circle of depravity. Romans 14, 13 says, So let's stop condemning each other. Decide instead to live in such a way that you will not cause another believer to stumble or fall. See, I, I don't I don't want to cause somebody to stumble and fall. I want to cause people to be closer to Jesus. I want to cause people to be closer to God. I don't want to be tripping people up in their walk with God. But there, there is, is a whole group of people that that's their aim is to pull other people into sin with them. We're not to be those people. We're to be the people that stand up for righteousness. 1 Corinthians 8, 9 through 13, New Living. It says, but you must be careful so that your freedom does not cause others with a weaker conscience to stumble. He's in the middle of a conversation about meat being sacrificed to idols. Now he's told them already that, you know, there's, there's nothing wrong with eating that meat. But there is something wrong if you take your freedom and cause somebody else to stumble. He moves on. For if others see you with your superior knowledge, eating in the temple of an idol, won't they be encouraged to violate their conscience by eating food that has been offered to an idol? So because of your superior knowledge, a weak believer for whom Christ died will be destroyed. And when you sin against another believer by encouraging them to do something that they believe is wrong, you are sinning against Christ. So if what I eat causes another believer to sin, I will never eat meat again, excuse me, again as long as I live. For I don't want to cause another believer to stumble. What, what do you mean? Like he's already told us, that there's nothing wrong with it, how would somebody eating it be wrong? But you see, if we, if, if we violate our conscience, we're sinning. In other words, if I do something that I think is wrong, but God doesn't really think it's wrong, I'm sinning. Because I've gone against my conscience. See, we were born with a, a dead conscience. And when we came to Jesus, Jesus revived our conscience. And now we have a good sense of what is right and what is wrong. But sometimes in being overly zealous for what is right, we think, oh, I can't do that. Some people were brought up with their parents teaching them that it is wrong to play cards. Now, I don't really understand why their, their parents taught them to not play cards. But, and, and some people might say, well, you're not allowed to gamble. Well, the Bible doesn't say that for one thing. But um, that's not really what my friends were taught. They were taught you can't play cards. I'm like, it's just a game. And you know, so if I had twisted their arm to play cards when they still believed that it was wrong, 
I would be the one that's wrong, and they would be sinning against their conscience. See, we as believers should never do something that we believe is wrong. Doesn't matter whether it is or not, according to Paul here. We need to live according to what our conscience says is right. So it is possible to be wrong when you're right. See, I could run around and say, there's nothing wrong with playing cards. And get somebody with a weak conscience to join in with me. And, and there isn't anything wrong with playing cards. But see, that person is stumbling because of my freedom in Christ. Am I making sense? Yes. So, when we get into this, what I really need to do is recognize the things which cause me to sin or even the people who entice me to sin. Because like John tells us, there's people out there, they're trying to cause us to stumble. They're trying to pull us away. They have the spirit of anti-Jesus. They're anti-Jesus. Matthew 18, 7 says this. Jesus is speaking. What sorrow awaits the world because it tempts people to sin? Temptations are inevitable. Temptation is not sin, by the way. But what sorrow awaits the person who does the tempting? See, we, don't, we need to make sure that we're not that person. Your freedom in Christ, my freedom in Christ, should not destroy somebody else's faith. Temptations are inevitable, Jesus says. Everybody's tempted. Jesus was tempted in every way, just as we are, Scripture tells us. But he didn't sin because he didn't give in to the temptation. People often think that they don't have to worry about temptation anymore because they're saved. <laughs> this is absolutely false. The whole book of Nehemiah is, <clears throat> is a true story, but it's also written there so that we learn to fortify the walls of our heart. We need to recognize our weaknesses. What they, what they did in the book of Nehemiah, they found that there were holes in the walls. And that it, the enemy could come in though, through those holes. Well, you and I have certain holes in our walls. And we need to be about repairing those holes, keeping an eye on those holes, so that the enemy doesn't get in again. Because I guarantee you, he wants to get in and he wants to build something that the Bible calls strongholds in your life. Strongholds that he controls in your life. Where he can make you lose. 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9, we've read this several times lately. Says, stay alert. <clears throat> Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. Remember that your family of believers all over the world is going through the same kind of suffering. So our enemy, the devil, is prowling around and it says, like a roaring lion. In other words, it's a metaphor. He's not a roaring lion. He's a toothless lion, if you remember who you are, in Christ. He's looking for someone in another translation. I like it better. It says, whom he may devour. See, he can't do anything to you that you don't let him do. He can't do anything to me that I don't let him do. But so often, we do the dumb thing, and we follow after these people of the world who have the spirit of Antichrist because they're offering something that looks fun. 
No, we don't do that. We don't violate our conscience. Because when we do, we sin. And we have an enemy out there who's trying to devour you and to devour me. We need to stand firm. We need to stand firm on the ground that Jesus has taken for us. We don't need to give up ground. Stand firm. First Thessalonians 5, 6 through 9. <clears throat> Paul says, so be on your guard, not asleep like the others. Stay alert and be clear-headed. Night is the time when people sleep and drinkers get drunk. But let us who live in the light be clear-headed, protected by the armor of faith and love, and wearing our helmet, the confidence of our salvation. For God chose to save us through the Lord Jesus Christ, not to pour out his anger on us. So stay alert. <clears throat> In other words, be aware of what's going on around you. Have you ever met somebody that doesn't seem to be aware of their surroundings? I know people like that. It drives me nuts. See, we need to be, be aware of what's going on around us. Not just in the physical world, but in the spiritual world. Do we know people who are caught up in that anti-Christ spirit, that anti-Jesus spirit, that spirit that compels people to do everything wrong that you can think of? Of course you do. What, would it, what do we do when those people come around? Well, we need to be aware. And we need to <clears throat> put our guard up. Oh, but you know, I grew up with them. They're, they're nice people. I, you know, I, I can't just, you know, what do you want me to do? They're, they're my friends. Well, maybe I need to get new friends. Maybe I need to get new friends. If they're going to lead me. And, and pressure me to do things that Jesus wouldn't want me to do. Or if they're going to make fun of me for doing the things that Jesus wants me to do, like going to church, like reading my Bible, like praying, like talking about Jesus and salvation, the forgiveness of sin, all that kind of stuff, then maybe I don't, I don't need to be around that person all that much. 1 John 1, 7-10 through 10 says, But if we're living in the light as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we claim we have no sin, we're only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. So these people want us to believe that we can do whatever we want to. That's opposite of what the Bible says. That is anti-biblical. So therefore it's anti-what? Christ it goes on but if we confess our sin to him he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness if we claim we have not sinned we are calling God a liar and showing that his word has no place in our hearts so you know what we all mess up from time to time what do you do about it you admit it we've for some reason, this has been in our Bible studies a whole lot the last several times. And that means God's trying to get a point across. There is nothing wrong with admitting that we are sinners. There's nothing wrong with admitting it when we've made a mistake and we confess our sin to God and we repent and let him turn us around. Nothing wrong with that. Because he's going to forgive you. But if I'm sinning. Just saying well you know I can just ask forgiveness whenever I want. Then when you do ask forgiveness. You're not really meaning it. You don't really mean that you want to turn away from your sin. You just mean that you got caught. And so forgive me of my sin. 
so that I can go do it again. That is not the purpose of confessing our sin. But some people would tell you it is. See, I came to Jesus so that he could change my life. How about you? I came to Jesus so that I wouldn't be the same slob I used to be. I wanted to be the person that God made me to be. That God created me to be. I wanted to be that guy. Well, I could never be that guy without Jesus. And so I don't need to be trying to figure out how much stuff I can get away with doing. I don't need to be trying to figure that out. How much stuff can I get away with? No. What I need to be figuring out is how far away from the person I used to be can I become? That's who, that's who I want to be. I didn't come to Jesus to stay in my sin. I came to Jesus not just to get forgiveness, but that I could look at myself someday and be happy with the person that I've become. I bet that's why you, you came to Jesus too. So let's not miss that path. That's your path. That's my path. Let's stay on it. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10. It says, Paul is speaking and he's going to tell us something that Jesus told him. Each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I'm glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in weaknesses and in insults, hardships, persecution, and trouble. Tru excuse me, in troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Now, don't, don't get this passage of Scripture wrong. His grace is all that we need. And His power works best in weakness... What he's trying to say is not that we go and continue down the bad path because we have grace. No. His power works best when we recognize that we are weak and he's the only way for us to be strong. So Paul said that he would take pleasure in weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecution, and troubles. Because when he's weak, then he is strong. We need to let Jesus be the strong person. We don't need to be that person who picks ourselves up by our bootstraps. No, we need to let Jesus pick us up. We need to let Jesus be strong. We need to recognize our weaknesses. Because when we're weak, he's strong. Not sitting around denying that we've ever done anything wrong. Not sitting around denying that we're not weak from time to time. Who's not weak from time to time? So we need to recognize those things and maybe even those people who cause us to sin or who tempt us to sin. The only person who can cause you to sin is you. But somebody else can tempt you to sin. Some situation can tempt you to sin. I don't recommend that alcoholics go have a ministry in a bar. Because his next point is that I must stay away from those things that cause me to sin. And I must even turn away from the people who could have a hand in causing me to sin. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 18, verses 8 through 10, So if your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better to enter eternal life with only one hand or one foot than to be thrown into the eternal fire with both your hands and feet. And if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. 
It's better to enter eternal life with only one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. See, whatever it is, see, we, need to, we need to pray and ask the Lord, what is it that could tempt me to sin and cause me to fall? And it's important enough to Jesus that we get rid of that thing, that even if that thing which causes you to fall is your hand or your foot or your eye, you get rid of it. Now let me ask you a question. Can your hand make you sin? Now I want to say it. We sin with our hands sometimes. We sin with our eyes sometimes. We sin with our feet sometimes. But did that hand or that foot take you over and cause you against your own will to do something bad? No. The cause of sin is my sinful, evil heart. Which the book of Jeremiah says, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. So everybody's out there saying, oh, just follow your heart. No, don't. That's another one of those antichrist things that we hear from time to time in the world. Following your heart could be the absolute worst thing you ever do. Proverbs 22.5 says, Corrupt people walk a thorny, treacherous road. Whoever values life will avoid it. I see people all the time trying to walk so closely to the world, as closely to the world as they can. thinking that they'll never fall in. But we walk so closely to those thorns and that treacherous road. That cliff is right there beside us. At some point, we're going to fall in. At some point, we're going to get stuck by the thorns. No, a, a wise person, a righteous person, stays as far away from those thorns as we possibly can stays as far away from that drop-off as we possibly can. James 1, verses 14 and 15. This is the NIV. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Did you just call me evil? He just called me evil. That's mean. Well, we have evil desires. And he says, then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. I don't want death. And I don't want wicked desires either. Evil, wicked desires. I don't want those. But you see, what he's talking about is your favorite sin comes along. And your own heart entices you to pleasure yourself with that favorite sin. Oh, come on, Don. How long has it been? Not long enough. We'd love to blame somebody else for our sin. But we're the problem. It's not Evelyn's fault that I've done something wrong. It's my fault. I mean, Evelyn could have even asked me to do it. And if I said yes, it would be my fault. Whose fault was it that Adam ate from the fruit? Well, Eve gave it to him. But Adam chose to eat it. That's why scripture says, sin came into the world through one man. 
It does not say sin came through the world into the world through one man and one woman. Yeah, Eve was involved. Yeah, she was. And Adam just said, yes, dear. But it wasn't Eve's fault. Adam was the one that God gave the command to. And Adam needed to make sure that he didn't let his wife talk him into doing something terrible. And thank you, Adam and Eve. Or I'll take that back. Thank you, Adam. Because of that, we've all been born into sin. We have this whole problem we talked about on Wednesday. James 4.1 says, What is causing quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires that war within you? See, even the, the arguments that we get into, they come from evil desires. Mark 7, verses 21 through 23, Jesus is speaking, and he says, From within, out of a person's heart, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, wickedness, deceit, lustful desires, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. Don't think he left anything out there. All these vile things come from within. They are what defile you. He's saying, you know, we have these evil thoughts and desires and stuff within us. We need to get them out. Only way to get them out is to surrender to Jesus. That's the only way to get them out is by the grace of God and by faith in Jesus Christ. We need to stay away from those things that cause us to sin. Even if that means cutting off our hand or our foot, although our hand or our foot couldn't cause us to sin. They're part of who we are. What causes us to sin is what's inside of us. So what's inside of you? Is it the Holy Spirit or is it the spirit of Antichrist? I hope it's the Holy Spirit. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5, Paul's talking to Timothy and says, you should know this, Timothy, that in the last days, there will be very difficult times. We're living in those times. For people will love only themselves and their money. Is that happening now? They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents, and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. Is that the time that we're living in now? Yep. Yep. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. Is that the time that we live in right now? Yes. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, and love pleasure rather than God. Wow, is that the time that we live in? They will act religious but they will reject the power that could make them godly. Stay away from people like that. See, sometimes we have to make a choice on our friends. Paul says if we know people like this, we need to stay away from them. Why? Because they're going to cause you to stumble. They're going to cause you to let your guard down. And suddenly you find yourself in a place you never thought you'd be in. God doesn't want that to happen to you. Jesus died so that that wouldn't happen to you. Stay away from people like that. Well, that sounds mean. No, what they're doing is mean. What you're doing is self-preservation. What you're doing is not only self-preservation, but if you're hanging around with people like that, then... Possibly other believers are going to see you hanging around with people like that. And they're going to hang around with people like that too. And it's just like we started out. We're going to become a stumbling block to other people.
Paul says there's another way in 2 Timothy 2, 22. Run from anything that stimulates youthful lusts. Instead, pursue righteous, righteous living, excuse me, faithfulness, love, and peace. Enjoy the companionship of those who call on the Lord with pure hearts. So he says, run from anything that stimulates youthful lusts. Those desires that he spelled out in 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. But then, like Paul often does, he gives us something to replace it with. He says, run away from anything that stimulates youthful lusts. Instead, let's pursue righteous living, faithfulness, love, and peace. And let's enjoy the companionship of those who call on the Lord with pure hearts. Love the way it's worded in the New Living Translation. Let's enjoy the companionship of those who call on the Lord with pure hearts. I love that. I love hanging out with people that love Jesus. I love people that are not anti-Jesus. People that are pro-Jesus. Don't try this at home. I'm a pro-Jesus. I'm a professional. No. Please try it at home. Be pro-Jesus. Let's not be anti-Christ. So it, it's what I always get whenever I, I do this teaching. I try to get to this uh, scripture in Genesis chapter 39. It's there. Maybe I can do it. Um, Genesis 39, 6 through 12. It's talking about Joseph, not Joseph, Jesus' stepdad, but Joseph, the patriarch. And Joseph was sold into slavery to this guy named Potiphar. I know it's a weird name. And in Genesis 39, starting with verse 6, it says, So Potiphar gave Joseph complete administrative responsibility over everything he owned. See, Joseph found favor with Potiphar, because of God being in his life. With Joseph there, he didn't worry about a thing, except what kind of food to eat. Joseph was a very handsome and well-built young man. And Potiphar's wife soon began to look at him lustfully. Is that actually in the Bible? Okay. Come and sleep with me, she demanded. Sounds like a soap opera, doesn't it? But Joseph refused. Look, he told her, my master trusts me with everything in his entire household. No one here has more authority than I do. He has held back nothing from me except you because you are his wife. How could I do such a wicked thing? It would be a great sin against Potiphar? No. No. It would be a great sin against God. She kept putting pressure on Joseph day after day, but he refused to sleep with her, and he kept out of her way as much as possible. So see, he was trying, he couldn't, he couldn't really tell Potiphar to fire his wife. <laughs> so, so he just had to stay in, in another part of the house or the yard or whatever when she was around. So he did that. One day, however, no one else was around when he went in to do his work. She came and grabbed him by his cloak, demanding, Come on, sleep with me. Joseph tore himself away, but he left his cloak in her hand as he ran from the house. Now, why did I just read that part? Well, because Joseph did what I'm talking to you about tonight, or today. Joseph was tempted. How do I know that he tempted? Because if he wasn't tempted, he wouldn't have had to avoid her. He wouldn't have had to run away. But what he did in the long run, after she wouldn't give up and kept pestering and kept pestering him, he ran away. Sometimes the best thing we can do 
is to get away from our temptation so that we don't do this great wickedness against God. See, no person was in the house, but the most important person was in the house. God was in the house. God's in the house. And Joseph knew that. He didn't want to disappoint God. So when she came, she grabbed his cloak. He ran away. He ended up getting in trouble for doing what he didn't do. But you know what? God had a plan. And God took that evil and he turned it into good. And he'll do that same thing in your life and mine. Let's determine not to become a stumbling block to anyone, whether a believer or an unbeliever. Let's recognize where sin comes from in our lives. And then let's stay far away from temptation so that we can make God proud of us. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you, you, you put warnings for us that the spirit of Antichrist is here even though the Antichrist himself has not revealed himself. So Lord, help, help us to not succumb to this spirit of anti-Jesus and help us to be determined to serve you with our whole heart every day of our lives. And with everybody's heads bowed and their eyes closed, how many of you this morning would say, you know, I've gotten caught up in to the ways of this world and I've, I've sort of tried to excuse myself for one reason or another, but I've, I'm realizing as the Holy Spirit's talking to me today that I haven't been running away from those things that, that tempt me. I know what they are, but I run right to them. And I need to repent of that. I need to change my mind. I need to be the guy that walks away because I'm not strong enough to handle those temptations. If that's you this morning, I would love to pray for you. Would you simply slip your hand up and put it back down? I know that I'm not in the room with you, but God can see you. The one that could see Joseph is looking at you right now. Anybody else before we pray? Lord, I thank you for those who lifted their hands. I thank you that even though I don't know why and I don't know who, you know who and you know why they raised their hands. So Lord, we come before you. We ask that you forgive us of our sin. Lord, we choose to turn away from those things which are sinful in our lives. Lord, we don't want to walk close to those thorns. We don't want to walk close to the edge of the cliff. We want to walk close to you. We want to walk in righteousness. Would you help us to do that? It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, um, don't forget, guys, men's fellowship tonight at 6 o'clock. Get a link from Chase or Bob, and uh, I'll see you then.